All right, we're continuing uh, in 2 Kings 10. This is going to be probably the last one in this series of story. And I sort of went along in this story on King Ahab because I decided to preach on the prophets of Baal and Elijah. And then I thought it would be interesting just following Ahab's story because Ahab, King Ahab has a lot of interesting stories along the way. So here, Jehu, who we learned about last week, when he started judging the house of Israel, God was using him to judge the house of Ahab. This really is a chapter where the house of Ahab is finished, right? Jehu accomplishes it. So if you remember, uh, Elijah said, hey, whoever Hazael doesn't kill, Jehu is going to slay. And if he, whoever Jehu doesn't slay, Elisha was going to slay. But Jehu actually does wipe out all of Ahab's house. So Elisha doesn't have to wipe out any of Ahab's house. And this was the judgment on Ahab's house for the wickedness that he had done as a king not only following in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, but also getting Israel to worship Baal. So if you remember last week, he started, he met them in Naboth's vineyard. They threw Jezebel out of the Tower of the Eunuchs. And then that was the fulfillment of Jezebel being eaten by the dogs and not being buried. Um, and now we continue to see what Jehu did as king and how he wiped out Ahab's line. But here we also learn about the zeal of Jehu. So if you, if you wanted to know, hey, what is the characteristic that Jehu is known for? He's known for his zeal, right? His passion. You know, zeal is when you're passionate about something, you go above and beyond. It multiplies your work when you're zealous, right? So let's, uh, let's go into 2 Kings 10 and we'll see there's three things here that he does, does in this story that are quite zealous, right? Where he's really, he's really quite over the top in how he's, he's gone about these things. And, and this is what he's known for, his zeal. You remember he was driving furiously when he was going towards uh, um, uh, Jezreel. So 2 Kings 10 says here in uh, verse 1, And Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. So Jezreel was like, I don't know, it's like a sort of like a regional town from Samaria. It's like different locations. So these 70 sons of Ahab, they're like his, his sons that are going to carry on that line, right? And they're all living in Samaria. So what does Jehu do? Ahab's had 70 sons in Samaria, and Jehu wrote letters and sent to Samaria unto the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to them that brought up Ahab's children. So you see in Samaria, you have the sons and then the people that brought up the sons of the king because the king and queen are not necessarily, you know, you know, raising all their own children, right? So he's got 70 sons in Samaria. Jehu writes letters to Samaria to the rulers of Jezreel. So the people ruling over Jezreel are in Samaria and to them that brought up Ahab's children, saying, Now as soon as this letter cometh to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, a fenced city also, and armor. So he's saying, hey, you've got all the stuff you need to fight, right? So you're there. Your master's sons are there with you, which are the sons of Ahab. You've got chariots, horses. You've got a fenced city, right? Like a castle um, and armor. Look even out the best and meet us. So that's like the most suit suitable, right? That's what meet means. I always think when I see the word meet in the Bible, I always think of Genesis when people say, uh, when, when people think that uh, God created uh, Eve, a help meet for him, right? And they think that a help meet is something, but it's not. It's, it's a helper that's suitable for Adam. That's not a help meet. But that, that sort of came a phrase. People talk about your wife being your help meet. Uh, Look even out the best and meet us of your master's sons and set him on his father's throne and fight for your master's house. So what is Jehu saying? He's writing a letter ahead, right? Because he's, now he's heading towards Jezreel. He's heading towards Samaria as he's fighting. He writes a letter on to Samaria and says, hey, you guys have stuff to fight with. You've got chariots, you've got horses. Choose one of the 70 sons that you think is the best to, to sort of come up against me. Put him on the father's throne and make him fight for your master's house to say basically, hey, Give, give, put somebody in charge to fight against me. But they were exceedingly afraid and, sa and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. How then shall we stand? Right? So who are the two kings he's talking about? Remember Ahaziah and, and Joram in the, in the chapter before when he went against them and they, and they were both killed in the, in the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite? So, but they were exceeding afraid and said, Behold, two kings stood not before him. So two kings couldn't stand against Jehu's army. How then shall we stand? 
And he that was over the house, and he that was over the city, the elders also, and the bringers up of the children, so he's saying basically all the people that were in charge um, in Samaria, sent to Jehu, saying, We are thy servants, and will do all that thou shalt bid us. We will not make any king, do thou that which is good in thine eyes. So they basically give up, saying, You know what? Hey, we belong to you. We'll do whatever you say. We're not going to set up another king and fight against you. You just tell us whatever you want us to do, and we're going to do it. Second Kings 10. Then he wrote a letter the second time to them, saying, If ye be mine, so he says, if you, if you do sort of swear your allegiance to me, and if you will hearken unto my voice, take ye the heads of the men your master's sons, and come to me to Jezreel by tomorrow this time. So they don't actually do that. They don't actually come to him, but this is what they do. So what is he saying to them? He's saying, hey, if you are loyal to me, I want you to basically kill all of Ahab's sons, take their heads off, and then bring them to me in Jezreel. Now the king's son, being 70 persons, were with the great men of the city, which brought them up. So he's saying, saying that, hey, that's where they were. They, they're the great men of the city in Samaria who ruled over Jezreel. The king's sons, the 70 sons of Ahab, were also living in Samaria at the time as well. Verse 7, And it came to pass when the letter came to them that they took the king's son and slew 70 persons and put their heads in baskets and sent him them to Jezreel. So they actually killed all 70 of Ahab's sons, put their heads in baskets and sent them off to Jezreel to show Ar Jehu that they had accomplished what he had said for them to do. And there came a messenger and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons. And he said, Lay ye them in two heaps at the entering in of the gate until the morning. So what is he saying? So they brought the heads and he basically pours out the heads into, into the gate of Jezreel before he enters into Jezreel and puts them there and says, hey, leave them there until, until the morning. And this is what you learn about Jehu in 2 Kings 10. He was a very zealous person, but he was also a very sort of scheming man as well. You know, the way he would, you know, manipulate things and, and trick people into thinking things. And you see this in 2 Kings 10. Verse 9, And it came to pass in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, Ye be righteous. Behold, I conspired against my master and slew him. But who slew all these? So what's going on here? Basically, because he's traveling to Jezreel, right? He sends that letter forward to say, hey, kill all of Ahab's sons, bring their heads. So they bring their heads. He pours them out in front of the gate. And then when he gets to Jezreel, he basically is talking to all the people that live at Jezreel and saying, hey, well, hey you got, you got, he's trying, if you see here, he's, he's like trying to get them on, the, on his side, right? And trying to sort of play this. I think he's, you know, it's like being political, right? Where he's trying to talk them up and butter them up and saying like, hey, you guys, you guys are, this is a righteous town. You know, hey, I, I at least have conspired against my master. You know, I, I, I've betrayed my master. But who slew, who slew all these? But the thing is, Jehu knows who slew all them, right? Because he was the one that sent the letter on and telling them to kill. So it's actually him, but he's trying to make it look like, hey, he doesn't know who slew all these people and trying to get the people on his side saying, hey, you're righteous, and then he says in verse 10, Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of, Je uh, house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So you see here, here how he's, he knows that he's the one that sort of gave that idea and said, hey, you guys do this. But he's trying to get the Jezreelites on his side. Hey, you are right. I've conspired against my master. But see, the Lord is already accomplishing basically what he said, you know, uh, about the house of Ahab so that the Jezreelites don't think to defend Ahab, right? They're going to be on his side and think, oh man, the Lord is on Jehu's side, right? Verse 11. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel. So you see there, so he's trying to get them on his side so they don't fight against him at Jezreel because there is the house of Ahab at Jezreel as well, right? He hasn't meet, reached Samaria yet. He's at Jezreel. He gets there and he says, hey, you know, you're not going to be able to stop this, right? Because I conspired against my master. But he's like, hey, somebody's killing all of Ahab. And he's trying to say to them, but it's actually him, right? And then in Jezreel, he, slew, he slays all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all his great men and his kinsfolks and his priests until he left him none 
remaining. So you see a Jew who's so zealous to accomplish everything that God had told him to do. Verse 12, And he arose and departed and came to Samaria. And as he was at the shearing house in the way, so now he's past Jezreel, right? Now he's going on to, into Samaria. Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah. So this is the second thing he does. So the first thing he does is he gets all the rulers in Samaria to kill all of Ahab's son by, by um, you know, making them fearful of what they're going to do, right? And then, then he tricks all of Jezreel into thinking, you know, who does that? But it was actually him. This is the second thing that, that happens. Now Jehu's going on to Samaria. Jehu met with the brethren of Ahaziah, king of Judah, and said, Who are ye? And they answered, We are the brethren of Ahaziah. And we go down to salute the children of the king and the children of the queen. And he said, take them alive. And they took them alive and slew them at the pit of the shearing house, even two and forty men, neither left he any of them. So he sees here that there are people coming to visit Ahaziah, but they don't know that Ahaziah is already dead, right? So they've come to visit the queen and the king and knowing that they belong to Ahaziah, right? They knew Ahaziah, he sl slays them as well. So you see how he's just really ze zealous about wiping out all these people that God wanted him to wipe out. Verse 15. And when he was departed thence, he lighted on jo Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he saluted him, right? So he said, I salute him. And said to him, is thine heart right? as my heart is with thy heart. So he's saying basically, are you on my side? And Jehonadab answered, it is. If it be, give me thine hand. And he gave him his hand and he took him up to, to him into the chariot. And he said, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So they made him ride in his chariot. So this is where I, I'm a little confused because Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, it's sort of like, he's sort of like a random character here. All of a sudden, he lights upon this man, Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, and basically invites him to say, hey, if you're right, if you're on my side, you come and join me and see my zeal for the Lord. And we see a bit later you know, what he means by that as he takes the son of Rechab, you know, Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, under his wing into his chariot to allow him to ride with him. And Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, was sort of like the master of his tribe, right? One of the heads of his tribe, the Rechabites. Now, we don't know much about Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, but I wanted to show you just these passages from Jeremiah 35. We just read through Jeremiah 35, and you might have remembered when we read through Jeremiah, we came across Jonadab, the son of Rechab. I believe it's the same person, right? This, this son of Rechab, Jonadab, who was a leader of his tribe. And we learn about him. But see, this is what, what I don't understand is like why just randomly as Jehu is going to fulfill the word of the Lord, he runs into Jonadab, right? Or maybe it's just like a mention to see, you know, because God actually honored jo Jonadab a lot in Jeremiah 35. But I'll just read a few verses in Jeremiah 35 and then I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you the story. It says here in Jeremiah 35 verse 12, Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my words, saith the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, excuse me, are performed. For unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandment. Notwithstanding, I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but ye hearkened not unto me. So that's the other time that Jonadab, or Jehonadab, as it is in 2 Kings 10, uh, the son of Rechab is mentioned. And I don't know why this is why he gets mentioned, but I just thought it'd be interesting if I cross-reference to you this story. But you can go back and read Jeremiah 35 if you want us to read it yourself. But the story in Jeremiah 35 is basically God tells Jeremiah to go to the Rechabites, right? They're the, they're the, the, um, the descendants of Jonadab, the son of Rechab. And, and obviously other, other people in that tribe. And he basically says to them, hey, go to the house of the Rechabites and offer them wine, right? And now the Rechabites, they, they didn't drink wine. And it wasn't because wine is sinful or anything like that. It's because Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which was one of their fathers of their tribe, had commanded saying, hey, as Rechabites, we are not going to eat anything of the vine. Right? So the Rechabites had a commandment from Jonadab saying, no, no, no one of the tribe of Rechabite is going to plant a vineyard. 
We're not going to eat any grapes. We're not going to drink any grape juice, let alone wine, right? So it's just, they said, they said nothing of that. So when God tells Jeremiah to go to the Rechabites and say, hey, offer them wine, the Rechabites say, well, we're not going to drink wine because Jonadab, the son of Rechab, right, our, our tribe, father, father of our tribe, said nobody is going to drink any wine or eat any grapes or even plant any vineyards. So what God says, he honours that tribe, right? He honours Jonadab, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, and say, hey, there's always going to be a man to stand before God in that tribe because he uses that, them as an example, saying, hey, look, the Rechabites are not even God's chosen people at the time. And he's saying, hey, these people are willing to obey the commandment of their father, Jonadab, the son of Rechab. But he's saying, Israel won't even hearken to my voice. Right? That's the story in Jeremiah 35. So he sends Jeremiah to go offer them wine to see, hey, they are keeping the commandment that their father gave them. And this is why, um, this is the significance of Jonadab. Now, I'm wondering if that's why, you know, Jonadab is sort of mentioned randomly in this story where Jehu is going to carry out this, this, uh, this, uh, this mission and he comes across Jonadab, the son of Rechab. And is that why, you know, he takes him on uh, and that sort of thing? I'm not too sure, but this obviously happened much earlier. Jeremiah is much later, right? Because Jeremiah is talking to the descendants of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, and the, and the tribe of the Rechabites. I just thought it, uh, it'd be interesting for you to, to learn that story. All right, let's continue. 2 Kings 10. And when he came to Samaria, he slew all that remained under Ahab in Samaria, till he had destroyed him according to the saying of the Lord, which he spake to Elijah. So now Jehu has arrived at Samaria. So not only did he kill all of Ahab in Jezreel, but when he came to Samaria, he did the same. Now, this is when Jehu does something really interesting. And if you don't, you maybe already know this story, if you've read this story before, but this is, I, I find, a really funny story of what Jehu did. Verse 18, Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu shall serve him much. So what is he saying here? He's saying when Ahab was king, man, compared to how Ahab served Baal, that's going to be nothing compared to how Jehu is going to serve Baal. And you're sort of thinking, what's going on here? Well, it's because you remember when Jehu, he's sort of a bit, he's like, he's like tricking them, right? He's tricking them and getting, getting the upper hand there. So if you remember, he tricked the Jezreelites, right? And he, and he sent the letter there. Well, he's doing the same here now, where he's tricking the people to get them together to accomplish what God has got him to do, which is to wipe out, you know, Baal all out of Samaria. So not only that, not only did he wipe out Ahab's house, but now he's planning to wipe out Baal from all of Israel. So what does he say? He's, he basically uh, proclaims saying, hey, we're going to do something really big for Baal. You thought Ahab worshipped Baal a lot? Jehu is going to worship him even more. Now therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, all his priests. Let none be wanting. Saying, hey, we want to make sure we get every single worshipper and prophet of Baal to this event for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whosoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. Look at this. But Jehu did it in subtlety to the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. So here we learn the intent of why he's doing that. And Jehu said, proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. What is that? It's saying, hey, gather everyone for this big feast, this solemn assembly where we are all going to worship Baal in this Bigger thing, bigger than Ahab's even done. Verse 21. And Jehu sent through all Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was full from one end to, the, uh, to, to another. So he gets all these people into the house of Baal, and he's saying yeah, the house is so packed, there's just people from one end to the other. Verse 22. And he said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. And he brought them forth vestments. I believe vestments are like maybe fancy clothing, right? So he's really getting it. He's getting everyone gathered. He's got all special clothes for them. He's really playing the part to say, Hey, we're going we're gonna to bring, you know, have, have, have this huge uh, solemn assembly for Baal. Verse 23, And Jehu went and Jehonadab the son of Rechab into the house of Baal and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search and look 
that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshippers of Baal only. So what is he saying here? He goes into the house of Baal with Jonadab, the son of Rechab, and he says, hey, make sure in here there's only worshippers of Baal. You know, this is, this is a place where we're going to worship Baal. We don't want any of the worshippers of the Lord in this place. So they search through to make sure everyone in there is there to worship Baal and not to worship the Lord. And when they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings, look at this, Jehu appointed four score men without. So how many is four score? A score is 20, four score is 80, right? Four score men without. And said, if any of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, he that letteth him go, his life shall be for the life of him. So you see how Jehu tricks all the worshippers of Baal to come to this great feast. He fills the house of Baal from one end to the other. He makes sure there's no worshippers of the Lord there. And then he appoints 80 men and saying, hey, if any of these people escape, your life will be for their life. Verse 25, And it came to pass as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, Go in and slay them. Let none come forth. And they smote them with the edge of the sword, and the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city of the house of Baal. And they brought forth the images out of the house of Baal and burned them. And they break down the image of Baal and break down the house of Baal and made it a draft house unto this day. Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. So what zeal from Jehu, right? Jehu is there, you know, he's, he's even tricking them into coming, you know, to this great feast. He sets up this huge thing just to be able to wipe them out. And in one fell swoop, Jehu actually wipes out all of the worshippers of Baal from Israel. Now, what's one thing we can learn from Jehu, right? Now, obviously, Jehu... Is not, he's not necessarily an example where you just do everything he does, right? He's an example of somebody that's zealous and he was appointed to carry out God's will, right? In the sense that God had appointed him to wipe out Ahab's house. Now, Jehu was so zealous that he went on to then wipe out the worshippers of Baal, right? And he also, you know, was quite deceiving in how he did it as well. So it's not that we're just taking Jehu as an example and just think, oh, God used Jehu, therefore everything that Jehu does is something does is something that we should emulate. No, we're just seeing the zeal of Jehu, but not necessarily that he did everything right. Because Jehu didn't do everything right. Jehu was still considered, you know, a king that did, did things wrong. And we're going to see that as we go into the later part of the chapter. But one thing I want you to take from Jehu is that God does want Christians to be zealous, right? He wants Christians to have passion, to take things seriously, to go over the top for him right? Not in the wrong way, but in the right way. And we see here in Revelation 3 where Jesus rebukes a church for not even being cold or hot, but being lukewarm, right? So we want to be zealous as Christians, right? We want to be passionate about the things of God and take things seriously. Have you ever seen people at work or even in their business where they're zealous about their work, yep. right? They're zealous about their business, you know, they're there all the time. They're always striving to learn more. They're always trying to improve. They're, they're going to all the extracurricular activities, right? Because they want to learn. They're passionate about it. They're zealous about it. This is how God wants you to be about Him, right? Revelation 3, verse 14. Jesus saying here, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. You see what God thinks about lukewarm Christianity? People think, yeah, well, you know, people say to you, well, hey, at least I'm in church. Or at least I'm reading my Bible every now and then. I'm not like the people that never go to church or don't care. God is saying here, yeah, he, he actually prefers that. He prefers, he prefers the people that are cold and not doing it. He's, he's saying here, yeah, I would rather that you were cold or hot. Obviously, ideally, he wants you to be hot. But the Christians that are lukewarm, God says, hey, this makes me sick. These Christians that are half in, half out, not passionate about the things of God, you actually make God sick. This is what he's saying here. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, 
I will spew thee out of my mouth. I mean, God forbid that our Christianity is like that, right? I don't want a Christianity that makes God sick. I want, I want my Christianity to be a Christianity that God is pleased with. Verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Isn't that interesting? That prosperity is what makes people lukewarm, right? Because when you got it too easy, right? And we live in a pros prosperous country. We've got it easy. And this is why people are lukewarm about the things of God. And have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's how God sees the lukewarm Christian that's got it easy, that doesn't think they need anything. He sees them as miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Let's go on. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest be, that thou mayest see. Right? So if you take on the wisdom of God, right? You take on how God is showing you how you are seeing, how you are seen in the eyes of God. He's hoping that you'll see your spiritual condition and you'll change. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Right? What is he saying here? Be zealous. Change. Don't just leave here and be the same. Right? Don't just be a lukewarm Christian. You need to change and get passionate about the things of God. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. See, God wants us to be passionate, right? He wants us to be zealous about the things of God. But he doesn't want us to be ignorantly zealous, right? Why is that? Because zeal multiplies your work. Now, if, you, if you're zealous and you're ignorant, you know, zeal multiplies bad and it multiplies good, right? So you can be zealous, but if you're ignorant, then that's not good as well. We need to grow right in zeal but we also have to grow in knowledge and this is why look at what uh, the bible says here about even about israel right it says here brethren my heart's desire and prayer to god for israel is that they might be saved for i bear them record that they have a zeal of god but not according to knowledge see so if you don't know the right things right and you get zealous that's why you need both you need to be zealous and you need to be zealous about knowing what the right thing is so that when you do works zealously, you don't just cause a lot of damage. You see that a lot in young Christians, right? And you don't want to you know, discourage people from obviously doing things for the Lord, but it's one thing to be aware of. Young Christians are often very zealous, right? They get very passionate. Why? Because it's new. It's exciting, right? I want to get into the faith. And then they go out and they, and they, 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 they get a bunch of people angry, right? Saying like, oh, you idiot, how can you not understand this? You know, new Christians go soul winning, they're like, hey! They're like shouting at people, like, I've been there too, man. Like when I was a young Christian, I mean, my wife seen me in those days at the beginning where I'm like shouting at people down the street, like, yeah, you idiot or whatever. Because you're zealous, right? But you're, it's the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, right? Because you're not actually growing in character. Because then you, you learn, oh man, I wonder how many people I turned away from Christ yeah. behaving like that, right? So now people, you know, they look at you, they're like, oh, you're a bit more mellow now. Well, I'm a bit more mellow because I've realized that, you know, when you just rub people the wrong way, you don't really get, get very far, especially when you're trying to preach them the gospel. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to preach somebody the gospel at the door and you want them to listen to you and you want them to understand the gospel, telling them they're an idiot is probably not going to help, you know? So we have to think about how we talk to people at the door and, and how we preach the gospel, right? Because we don't want to have a zeal, but not according to knowledge and do much damage. Now, this unfortunately is the end of Jehu. You know, Jehu started out well in the sense that he, he, he zealously tried to accomplish what God wanted him to do. But the sad thing about Jehu, when you read his story, is it did not end well for him. We can learn some things from his story. 2 Kings 10 verse 29. Howbeit from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them. To wit, if you remember, you guys forgot the, the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. We're reminded here, the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. So that was the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He made the two golden calves. He put them in two locations and he said to Israel, hey, these are the gods that brought you out of the land of Egypt. 
And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. So you see, Jehu didn't end well, but God said, Hey, because you did accomplish my will, you did wipe out Ahab's house like I had asked you to do. He says, Hey, you will have a son sitting on the throne for the next four generations. But after that, obviously, it was taken by somebody else. Verse 31, But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So we see here, too often, I mean, Jehu can really represent our spiritual life. You know, our life as a Christian, if we are not careful, right? You can see the Christian walk of somebody who is not grounded in the faith, the stony ground hearer, right? The one that's amongst the rocks, doesn't have knowledge, doesn't, isn't in the right atmosphere, doesn't purpose to follow the Lord with all their heart. Your Christianity could end up like Jehu's reign, right? Where you start off zealous. Everything's new at the beginning, right? Everything's exciting. It's easy to get passionate when everything's new and exciting and you're learning things. But it takes a level of, you have to grow to the point where you don't just do things because it feels good. You don't just do things because it's convenient. You don't just do things because it's fun. Like here, it says here, Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. You see here, it took some purpose, right? It took him to decide, hey, you know what? It doesn't matter if, if it doesn't feel good, if it's not fun, I'm going to do it anyway. That's what it takes in the Christian walk if you want to be successful in your spiritual life and end well. Because the people that don't purpose in their heart, you know, to walk in the, in the law of the Lord, to walk in the way of the Lord, they're the ones that get out of church. They're the ones that have kids grow up and they're not in church because why? They're not going to church. Their kids don't know anything about God. They're the kids that, you know, grow up not knowing anything about God, not understanding anything about God. Why? Because the parents have not taken the time to purpose in their heart to walk in the ways of the Lord, to learn, to be passionate, to be zealous, to be genuine about their Christianity. Right? You guys, I'm sure you guys have grown in Christian homes where you saw your parents not genuine about their Christianity. What impression did that leave you? Right? You'd be like, this is a joke. Right? I don't want my kids growing up thinking Christianity is a joke. Right? This is, this is real what's going on here. People are going to hell. This is not a game we play in Christianity. We need to preach the gospel to get people saved. Jehu didn't take heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. Don't let this happen to your spiritual life. The other thing as well here is we see because he didn't purpose to walk in the ways of the Lord, he didn't cut the sin out of his life. That's another thing that's going to destroy your spiritual life. Right? You think you got zealous at the beginning, you're getting zealous for the Lord, but if you don't change, you don't cut that sin out of your life, your love for the Lord, your zeal, your passion, it starts to die, doesn't it? Right? It starts to die. Because that's how it works. That's what worked with Jehu, right? He didn't cut the sin out of his life. You go back to your old ways, right? You're not as passionate anymore. This is how spiritual life works. Because why? You're walking in the flesh. You're not walking in the spirit. So if you don't purpose in your heart to do what's right, don't just go on your emotions. Don't just do it because other people are doing it, because it's fun. You need to take it upon yourself. You need to purpose in your heart. Hey, I am going to do what's right even if nobody does what's right. I'm going to make a change in my life. I'm going to cut the sin out of my life so that my spiritual life ends well. It keeps growing. Because look at what happened here. We get the example of Jehu, right? Started off well but he didn't purpose in his heart to walk in the way of the Lord. Didn't cut the sin out of Israel, right? The sin that he got from his father. Sometimes we get bad traditions passed down, bad habits, right? Maybe we took up bad habits that have just been passed down and we think, well, everyone does it and things like that. Bad habits get passed down. You need to cut that out if that is affecting your spiritual life. Look at what it says here. Verse 31, there's a few more verses and then we'll end. So he didn't purpose to walk in, in, the, in the law of the Lord God with all his heart. He didn't get rid, he didn't depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And look at what it says here in verse 32. So taking this physical example of Jehu and applying it to our spiritual life, it says, In those days the Lord began to cut Israel short 
and Hazael smote them in all the coasts of Israel. What's happening? He's starting to lose battles now. Right? He's starting to lose the fight. Remember, because Israel is fighting against Hazael. Do you remember the king of Syria? That was who Joram was wounded against. And that's why uh, um, uh, Jehu met them you know, when he was wounded. So now Jehu is king of Israel, right? Now he's fighting with Hazael. And because he didn't purpose to walk in the law of the Lord, he didn't depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he is starting to lose these battles. And this is what happens in your spiritual life too. If you don't purpose in your heart, you don't cut those sins out, you will start losing spiritual battles and you'll fall back into your old ways. You might fall back into fornication. You might fall back into some drug problem, right? People get drugs. You might fall back to hanging out with the wrong crowd, right? Getting out of church, doing these things, going back to your old habits. Hazael smote them in all the coasts of Israel, from Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead, the Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites from Aroah, which is by the river Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan. So he's coming from Jordan eastward, right? All the land. So I just think it's interesting. It gives you an idea of where they're fighting, right? The Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites. You guys remember those tribes and the story about it? Remember when they were going into the promised land? And the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the Manassites said, hey, we want to stay on this side. You know, if we're going to go in and fight with you, but we'll stay here. So, you know, it's sort of a reference back to that, right? Where they're fighting around the River Jordan, but they're even fighting even to the other side of Jordan, where the Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites live. From Aroah, which is by the River Arnon, even Gilead and Bashan. Now, the rest of the acts of Jehu and all that he did and all his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? Jehu slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, and Jehoahaz, his son, reigned in his stead. And the time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was twenty and eight years. So I've just underlined twenty and eight years, because sometimes when you read through the Bible, you're reading through these stories, and you just think, like, things are just happening like this, right? But then you come across these verses, it gives you a timeline of how long it takes. So he actually reigned in Israel, and he was reigning for twenty eight years. That's a long time, twenty eight years. Yeah, you might feel like you know we've had. Yeah, you know, it's hard to use an example in Australia because our prime ministers change like every month. But let's say like you know prime minister change you know for four years be like oh I feel like I had this prime minister forever. I mean this guy's reigning for 28 years, like seven. Is it four years? Or is it three? It's three years in America. Right? It's four years here, right? Um, you know I say seven terms of prime ministers. So this is a long time. So that's why it's not always overnight. That's why I always say with the parable of the sower. The parable of the soul with the stony ground, it's not a Christian that's just come into church, they're here a couple of times and then they get out, right? You know, maybe they didn't make friends or whatever or, you know, whatever. You know, there's people like that too. But the stony ground here can also be after a period of time, right? Because Christianity should be a lifelong thing. So I see the stony ground here as somebody who's in church, they're zealous, they're there for a few years, they're really involved, but five, ten years later, they're out. You might think, oh, it's like five, ten years. Well, Jehu reigned for twenty and eight years. That was a long time. But did he end well? Did his reign end well? No. Why? Because he didn't purpose in his heart to walk in the law of the Lord. He didn't cut the sin out of his life. And that made him start to lose physical battles. If you don't do the same, you'll start to lose those spiritual battles. Anyways, I hope you take that to heart. Um, you know, let's try and change, guys. Don't just continue to be the same person. You need to purpose in your heart to make that change. C growing in Christianity doesn't just happen. I'll tell you that. You know, I'm sure you guys know it. It does not just, don't just think Christianity happens by osmosis. Yeah. You know, where it's just, if I, yeah, hey, it helps, right? Helps to be around, to keep you on the right track. But nobody's, nobody's getting, getting, you know, nobody's, uh, you know, nobody's going to make you come to church. You know, you got to, you got to get up. Nobody's going to make you read the Bible. You know, I mean, you're the one that has to actually read the Bible and grow. Nobody's going to make you go soul winning. You know, we we try, right? <laughs> we try and make people go, but they don't want to do it because at the end of the day, you're the one that has to do it. And if you don't make a change in your spiritual life, you're just not going to grow. You know, and you may not end well as a Christian. All right, let's pray. All right, thank you, Lord, for the story of Jehu. Um, I pray, Lord, that we would learn from the example. Uh, Lord, help us to be zealous, but help us not to be ignorant. And I pray, Lord, that we would purpose in our heart, to, that we would take heed to walk in the law of the Lord. Help us to cut the sin out of our life, Lord. And um, I pray, Lord, that, you know, 
20, 30, 40 years from now, you know, we'll still be serving the Lord faithfully, no matter where we are, no matter, you know, where our paths lead us, Lord. I pray, Lord, for everyone in this church that, that they would grow, that they would take heed, that they would um, internalize and, and just realize, you know, how much you've done for them, Lord, so that it will compel them to serve you. And uh, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Uh, we pray all these things in his name. Amen.